Hi, hello everyone. Well, we're going to do things a little bit differently today. I'm going to upload some of my neurotransmitter videos now in English. Why is that? Because I've been working with TED Education on a video that I will leave the link on the um, on one of these videos. Uh, but anyways, if you like these English videos, I will keep uploading them. If you don't like them, I will stop after the neurotransmitters are translated. And I hope you like them and leave all the um, questions in the comment section. So let's begin with maybe one of the most important neurotransmitters in the brain, the glutamate. Glutamate it's the main, is the main excitatory neurotransmitter in the central nervous system. This is very relevant because it means that it is responsible di directly for up to 80% of energy consumption in the brain. Half of all the uh, synapses in the brain are glutamatergic. So half of all the things that the brain does are done by this neurotransmitter, this chemical signal. Uh, it has also, besides its use in synapses and activating neurons, it has an important participation in glucose met metabolism, we're going to review it a little bit later, in amino acid metabolism, and it has important antioxidant formation, mainly through the, synthesi the synthesis of glutathione. Uh, it also serves as the precursor of another essential neurotransmitter in the brain called GABA. GABA is actually the main inhibitory neurotransmitter in the brain. We will review it in a different video. And glutamate, uh, the functions that it does or that it has on the brain are uh, among motion, sensation, emotion, cognition, and many others. Pain sensation, for example, a very important function of glutamate. So how does our brain produce this glutamate essential for its uh, functions? Well, basically what it does, it's, it takes a glucose molecule, a glucose obtained from food and from all these places, and it takes the carbon uh, skeleton that the glucose has. These five carbons, it takes them, and basically it takes an uh, amino group from an amino acid, uh, mainly uh, an amino acid called glutamine, we're going to view it in a... Uh, for a little bit further. So basically we take this amino group and we attach it to the carbon skeleton of glucose, allowing us to produce the final molecule of glutamate. Once we have synthesized uh, glutamate, this glutamate will remain in our neuron for a while, and then a specific part of the neuron, called the dendrite, will have something called a vesicle. This vesicle is basically like a lipid droplet, and it has a special set of proteins that allow it to capture all of the glutamate that you have in the cytoplasmic space. So all of the free glutamate will get trapped inside of our vesicle and it will wait there. Why do we want it to wait? Because we want the signaling from glutamate to come only when we want to excite another neuron. So only when our neuron A wants to send a signal to neuron B, we want glutamate to be released. And how do we do this? We will couple glutamate release into the synaptic cleft, into this little space between one neuron and the other to activate neuron B, we will um, synchronize it with the activity of neuron A. And we will do this through something called an action potential. Basically, our neuron in its resting state, I will change colors here, when we're in this resting state, our neuron is negatively charged because of the difference of positive ions on the outside of the cell compared with positive ions in the inside of the cell. We will watch that in another video if you wish. So the thing is we have a lot of, a lot of negatively charged neurons and when we generate an activity burst of this neuron, basically we will open compartments through which sodium, that it's a positively charged ion, can get in. So when we have this positively charged ion uh, that it's outside of the cell, and we open a door towards a place that it's very negatively charged, this ion, this sodium, will uh, flow through all of the cell. This is this little uh, lightning that we see here. It's all of the sodium ions that are crossing through the cell, through the neuron. And the thing is, once we get to the terminal place where the vesicles are resting, we will open a second uh, ion channel, the voltage-dependent calcium channel. So in this terminal part, we open up a calcium channel. These ca uh, this calcium channels will allow calcium to get in, and calcium will basically do as a babysitter. It will grab the vesicle by the hand and it will make it fusion with the terminal part of the dendrite, releasing all of the glutamate into this uh, space between neurons called the synaptic, the synaptic cleft. 
then glutamate is free to access this second neuron and activate these little pl uh, places of its membrane where we will find the glutamate receptors. So what happens? We have already depolarized it, so calcium has go come in and make the vesicles fusion with this terminal dendrite. And now glutamate is in the, synapt in the synaptic cleft, ready to activate our B neuron. This would be the B neuron. However, we have to have a very strict control over the glutamate release and how long does glutamate stays in the synaptic cleft. This is why an other cell called the astrocyte, very important cell, a part of the glial cells, has a special transporter. This special transporter will also use sodium outside of the cell and it will couple it with the transport of glutamate. Basically, sodium, as always, is desperate to get inside of the cell. So the astrocyte said, okay, you want to come in, you can come in. But if you want to come in, you have to bring a glutamate with you. So every time that these sodium molecules get in, because their gradient is very strong, because astrocytes are also very neg negatively charged, so every time that a sodium molecule comes in, it brings along a, a glutamate molecule. What will happen then? Astrocytes can take up 90% of all of the glutamate released into the synaptic cleft. This allows glutamate transmission or neurotransmission to be very specific. So we depolarized our first neuron, we released glutamate into, into the synaptic cleft and we activate the V neuron. And this activation lasts for very short periods of time. So one impulse in neuron A causes one impulse in neuron B approximately. Thanks to this uh, recapturing mechanism that astrocytes have. Now, once we have astrocytes filled with this glutamate, well, they have to do something with it. They have to metabolize it. So astrocytes, to metabolize this glutamate, they are very rich in an enzyme called glutamine synthase. synthetase. This glutamine synthetase will uh, grab this glutamate and it will uh, adhere or it will stick an other amino group on this glutamate generating an amino acid with two amino groups called glutamine. And then this glutamine that is no longer effective or it can no longer activate uh, any neurons, so it's, uh, it essentially doesn't do anything, it can be donated back to the neurons. And once glutamine is in the first neuron, in our neuron A, it is uh, degraded by, a, by an enzyme called glutaminase. This glutaminase will basically separate the amino group and we will be able to reuse it. How we will reuse it? Well, NH3, this amino group, can then be adhered to other glucose groups generating more glutamate. So what, what is the life cycle of this amino group? Basically it adheres here to a glucose uh, molecule, it gets into the best glass glutamate, glutamate is released in the, synapt in the synaptic cleft, it activates neuron B, once it, has, yeah, once it has activated it, so it gets recaptured into the astrocyte through this transporter called GLT1. Uh, GLT1. Once in the astrocytes, after the uh, recapturing has occurred, we adhere a second um, amino group that comes from ammonia and we generate. Glut uh, glutamine. Glutamine is uh, innocuous, it doesn't do anything, it can't activate neurons, so it gets released and retaken by the first neuron, and this first neuron can take away the amino group and adhere it to a new glucose molecule. This allows us for a recycling of up to 60% of all the nitrogen that our neurons used to uh, produce this neurotransmitter. This is very important because uh, since glutamate is responsible for up to 50% of all the sy synapses in the brain, it would consume a lot of energy and a lot of nitrogen if it didn't get recycled. Now what's the function? How does this glutamate activate our neuron B? Well, the most important part are the uh, glutamate receptors and of all the receptors uh, we're going to review two of them uh, mainly because it's the main ones and it's the ionic uh, receptors. So basically we would have here a little protein that responds to glutamate and once glutamate attaches to this protein it will open up a channel that will allow for the free flow of ions. The first receptor that we activate upon glutamate release is a receptor called, called AMPA. 
This AMPA receptor, when glutamate is in its position, let me draw glutamate in its position, so we have already a molecule here. Basically, this changes the, structure, the structural conformation of the AMPA receptor, allowing sodium to get in the cell. So when we check the uh, electric potential of this neuron, we can see that as positively charged ions get in, the neuron starts depolarizing. And when this neuron depolarizes up to about uh, minus 56, it has the famous action potential that we will review in a later class. And then it will uh, go through all of the changes of an action potential. When we see this uh, electrical manifestation in a neuron or in an excitable cell, neurons or muscles, we will be talking about activity. So a neuron that has gone through this action potential has just depolarized and has said, uh, sent the signal to other parts of the brain and release neurotransmitter, neurotransmitters in turn. So the basic response that we can expect after administering glutamate to a neuron is the opening of, of the AMPA receptors, the flow of sodium ions inside the cell, and this action potential that we see here. However, we have a second glutamate receptor that doesn't work uh, in the first place. So NMDA receptors, they are extremely important but they do not function when we first release glutamate. And that is because they are blocked. So even if glutamate came here and tried to activate the receptor, it, the receptor opened, so sodium tried to get in, but there was something blocking the way. It was a, a magnesium molecule. So magnesium didn't allow for the receptor to generate its function. What do we need to deblock or to allow this NMDA receptor to function? Well, it's pretty obvious. When we release glutamate and we activate AMPA receptors, all of these positively charged sodium molecules will unplug or will um, take, up, take out the cork that magnesium represents for the NMDA channel. So all of this first depolarization of our neuron, and all of this uh, depolarization, when our neuron was in plus 35, this uh, implied that there were a lot, a lot of uh, positively charged ions. And magnesium, magnesium since it, it is also positively charged, get, gets expelled. This means that the second time we release glutamate, we will now have a permeable NMDA receptor and it will allow for ion flow. And NMDA receptors are not like AMPA receptors because they allow for sodium and calcium to get in the cell. And this is extremely important because calcium is a very important second messenger. When calcium starts to accumulate inside of the cell, it generates a series of changes. What are the main changes that we can expect after calcium entry? We can activate a protein called calmodulin. We can activate a protein kinase called protein kinase C and protein kinase A. These protein kinases, uh, they grab all of the proteins of our cell and they start adhering phos phosphate groups. So if I get to activate my NMDA receptor and calcium starts to flow in, calcium will activate calmodulin, uh, PKC and PKA, and this will go through all of my cell and it, they will start to adhere phosphatum, phosphorus groups to these cells. And why is that important? Why does this make any difference? Because once we have these uh, phosphate groups in our proteins, they will start working a lot more. So if uh, my AMPA receptor usually let in like, I don't know, seven sodium uh, ions, I, I'm just making up this number, but now after the phosphate group has been added, it will allow 70 sodium ions. And the same will apply to the NM NMDA channel. The activation of the NM NMDA channel and the calcium increase inside of the cell can cause the NMDA channel to allow more of calcium and more sodium to get in. So this creates a positive forward loop each time it passes. So it's pretty obvious to know or to assume that NMDA receptors cause an increase and an increase in the synaptic ability or in the synaptic connection between two neurons. If I start to release many, many times or in high concentrations this glutamate, this synapse will start to get stronger and stronger and stronger. 
in a process called long-term potentiation. So when we activate this LTP, uh, the, this NMDA channel, we will cause a, pro a process called long-term potentiation. And it's the process when a neuron generates a stronger synapse and a stronger connection with an, a second neuron after a while of being activated. And this is the molecular basis of processes uh, so important as memory and as pain, uh, chronic pain for example, is uh, this uh, synapse that learn to be or to feel pain. Calcium entry will also generate change in gene expression. So the genes of our cell will change. Once we have this calcium influx, some proteins may be overexpressed or underexpressed. So we not only have these old receptors working more, working extra time, but we now have a lot of new extra receptors. So we have already reviewed the most important receptors of glutamate that we know so far, that it's AMPA and NMDA. These are both ionotropic receptors. AMPA is permeable mainly to sodium and NMDA is permeable, is permeable mainly to sodium and calcium and it's responsible mainly of LTP, long-term potentiation and this uh, strengthening of synapses causing memory and causing pain. We have another ionotropic receptor called kinet. This kinet receptor has not been so studied, it's really important, but we don't know for what yet. So I will not review it uh, any further. But this is permeable to sodium uh, as well as AMPA receptors. And we have also metabotropic receptors in the glutamate family receptor. We have mainly the mglu one This is a metabotropic receptor that couples um, G protein subunit Q. This is a family of second messengers, a very important family. We have the mglu 2 uh, It's also a metabotropic and it couples to PGI. So it's an inhibitory receptor, it diminishes activities in neurons. And we have the mglu 3 it's also metabotropic and it also is inhibitory because it couples with PGI. So the fact that we have two inhibitory receptors in the glutamate family, it's very important because they are the only ones. So they probably have very important functions, we just haven't discovered them yet. Now, uh, talking about pharmacology, uh, since glutamate is such an important neurotransmitter, it would be logical to assume that the drugs that we have designed to work over this system, they are. Uh, we should have a lot. We should have a lot of drugs that work on this system. However, it is not the case. We don't have a lot of, a lot of drugs. We have very few drugs and we don't have very useful drugs. The main one, the most used in the clinical context, is ketamine. Ketamine is an anesthetic, so when we, you are going to get a surgery or you are going to do surgery on someone, uh, the anesthesiologist will uh, probably administer ketamine, and this will induce in the patient a state of complete unconsciousness, and you will be able to cut him, get out some organs or whatever. And this, basically what it does, ketamine, it uh, travels to the brain and it blocks glutamate receptors. And since, since these glutamate receptors are essential for processes like consciousness, then the patient will be completely unconscious. Ketamine is also being tested for chronic pain, since it has a very important capacity to block the NMDA receptor. So we hypothesize that it could diminish, especially neuropathic pain. A second group of drugs, amantadine and memantine, these, were, these ones were discovered or were developed from an antiviral, it's an anti-influenza drug. But when research was conducted over neurotransmitters, we discovered that amantadine and memantine can also block the NMDA receptor. So these drugs are being evaluated for their therapeutic potential. They haven't been, uh, they don't have a clear indication yet. They are used in Alzheimer's disease and in some other pathologies. However, their indication is still a little controversial. Phenylcyclidine, uh, you have probably not heard of it, or I hope you haven't heard of it. It's basically an abuse drug that blocks also uh, glutamate receptors, and I won't get any further uh, with this drug. Later on, if we do a series of uh, videos about drugs, we will mention it. And finally, we have ampakins. Ampakins are very curious drugs. They can activate AMPA receptors when at low doses 
of AMPA receptor, uh, uh, sorry, of glutamate in the synaptic cleft. So when glutamate is low, it increases its affinity. So it increases the activity of glutamate even if it's low in concentration. So it's very good in memory deficits, for example. If you give it to someone who has memory problems, you increase glutamate in the synaptic cleft and you probably increase the memory capacity of that patient. However, ampakins have another property that it's when glutamate is really high, so you have a lot of glutamate in your synaptic cleft, it blocks part of its activity, so it doesn't let glutamate do its job on the synaptic cleft. Very useful for patients that are developing chronic pain. Chronic pain is a pathology where you have a lot of glutamate and the synapse gets long-term potentiation towards feeling pain all of the time. So if we manage to block a little bit of this glutamate activity, we can improve the quality of life of these patients. Well, if you want to know more of this topic, I suggest you uh, check out this book, Basic Neurochemistry of Dr. Siegel, and this article, very good article of Dr. Vanderberg, a little, um, well, it's not that old, but it's a really good, good article about glutamate recapturing and glutamate transportation in the brain. Well, this is it for today. Uh, once again, if you like these videos, let me know. If you don't like them, just be a little patient with the neurotransmitter videos. And um, as always, uh, help us change the world, share the information.